John Torres with NBC News on his Facebook Live. It's Friday, January 8th, and what I'm going to do on this Facebook Live is what I typically do. I give you some headlines and give you information behind the headlines. Hopefully information that you can use to help you, your family, your loved ones, your community get through this pandemic sooner rather than later and in the healthiest fashion as possible. I like to give you the information behind the headlines because sometimes the headlines can be a bit confusing and give you a better understanding of what's going on there. And then once I get through the headlines, answer your questions. So if you have questions, please send them our way, and I'll try to get to as many of those as I can in the time period we have. But first, let me start with the headlines, and starting at the top with the numbers that are going on right now, and what's happening across the country and across the globe. As you've heard me talk about in the past, and a lot of experts talk about saying, you know, over the holiday period, we're talking pretty much from Thanksgiving through New Year's, that we knew that travel was going to increase. We knew when travel increased, we see an increase in cases. And once we saw the increases in cases, hospitalizations, and unfortunately deaths would follow that. And these things typically happen in two-week increments. And what we're seeing now are the cases that are cropping up and some of the hospitalizations from traveling over the December holidays, in particular over the Christmas holidays. And we haven't even yet started to see the travel, the cases that are increasing because of the travel over the New Year's holiday. And so that's still to come, probably starting right around now. But unfortunately, what we're seeing are new records everywhere. And the new records, cases, 268,000 cases in a single day yesterday, 268,000 cases. That's over a quarter million cases of confirmed coronavirus here in the United States. Unfortunately, we also set a record for deaths, 4,110 deaths in a single day. These are very, very high numbers. And the concern is we think those numbers are going to go even higher over the next couple of weeks. And here's why. These things typically happen in two-week increments. And if you think about coronavirus itself, it's usually a 14-day incubation period, up to 14 days. And that's why people quarantine themselves for 14 days to make sure they don't have it and can't spread it to somebody else. And so think of these as two-week increments. And so if somebody traveled over the New Year's holiday, and let's say they came back January 3rd, which is when t people typically come back, well, seven days after that would be January 10th, which would be this coming Sunday. A week after that would be January 17th, which would be the following Sunday. And that's the two-week time period we're talking about where we're going to start seeing numbers going up. Right now, the numbers we're seeing increase are mainly from the Christmas holiday time period because this is that two-week period. And so, again, things happen in two-week increments. So think about it this way. Two weeks, cases start going up. Two weeks after that, the people that have cases start to get sicker and they end up hospitalized. So two weeks, cases go up. Two weeks later, which is four weeks, hospitalizations go up. And then two weeks after that, deaths start going up because the people that are getting hospitalized, unfortunately, some of them die from COVID-19. And so we're talking a six-week time period after these holidays before we can say, okay, we are clear of that holiday effect of happening cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. So we're right in the midst of it. And most experts think things are going to get even worse. And as I said on one of the platforms I was on today, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could start getting this under control right now? Now, I know the vaccine's out there, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But the vaccine's out there. It's not the one thing that's going to end this all. It's not the end all for the pandemic because the pandemic and the driving numbers, the driving issue behind the high numbers of cases, hospitalizations and deaths is simply human behavior. Us not doing those things we know we need to do to get things under control. And I get it. We're all completely tired of staying isolated. We're all completely tired of wearing masks, not going out to dinner, not hanging out with our families and friends. At the same time, though, the more we do that, the sooner we'll get through this pandemic with the vaccine adding on to that and certainly helping out. But at the same time, it's going to take that human behavior to get this pandemic under control. So think about those numbers again. 268,000 cases, over 4,000 deaths in a single day. And we think those numbers are going to go even higher. So now is the time we always think about New Year's resolutions. Make a resolution to double down on those things we know work. Wear a mask, watch your distance, wash your hands, ventilate, open windows, and then don't go out. Try and stay as isolated as you can to try and keep this under control to protect you, your family, your loved ones, and your community. And so those are the numbers. And it's not just here. It's increasing around the world. The UK has just implemented shutdowns. Germany's looking at what they need to do because their cases are going up. If you look at different countries around the world, even countries that seem to have been doing well, South Korea, Taiwan, they're having issues as well. 
because the it, it's difficult to get people not to travel over these time periods when they desperately want to be with their family, their friends, and their loved ones. And again, I fully understand that. I missed my family and friends over the holidays as much as anybody. Uh, just making that extra effort, especially now that we're through the holidays, to double down on not doing those things, on doing what we know can help keep us protected, can really help out and help get this pandemic under control. Plus, getting the vaccine when it comes along, because we definitely need to get to that herd immunity level. And on that, let's talk about the virus itself, because one of the other headlines is the variants you've probably heard about. There's a UK, a United Kingdom UK variant that's out there, and then there's a South African variant. And this has some people worried because this variant has changed a little bit. And what we're finding out is the variant, which is basically a mutation of the virus itself, and in this case, a mutation of what we call the spike protein. So remember, the virus is a ball. It has these little spikes that go through the ball. Those spikes are what attach it to the cells in our body. And when it attaches, then the virus is able to do what it does in order to duplicate and replicate itself inside our body. So those spike proteins have changed a little bit. There have been some mutations in the spike proteins. And those mutations mean, in this case, it's more contagious. It's more infectious. So people can catch it and spread it more easily than they could the other mutations that have come along. On the good side of the news, if there is, is, is any good news to this, is even though it's more infectious, meaning you can catch it and spread it more. It doesn't seem to cause any more complications, doesn't seem to be more deadly. So that's good news. However, remember, the higher number of cases you have, the higher deaths you're going to have on top of that because as numbers rise in one category, they rise in the other. But overall, this one virus does not seem to cause any more issues with complications and death than the other viruses that have come along or the other mutations, but it's more infectious. In other words, people can catch it a lot easier, and that's what we think might be behind the spread. I'll give you an example. In the UK, they first started looking at this in September. September, and then in December, they started noticing in parts of the country it was the predominant virus, and now they just noticed in the country entirely it seems to be around 80% of the virus. And so it's really taken over the country. It's in other areas. It's, I think the last number I heard was 30 plus countries have confirmed it. Here in the U.S., we've confirmed it in some areas. And if it's confirmed in some areas, that means it's in a lot more areas as well because that community spread is there. And we don't have the, the resources right now to track that spread. They're putting those in place. And once they do, we'll get a better understanding of this mutation and others. But this is the natural progression of viruses in general. And new viruses like this even more so. They continually change. Good news is the changes here. Pfizer came out with news saying it looks like from their lab studies that the vaccine can handle these changes. It's still effective against these changes. Moderna, AstraZeneca said by all indications, and they're doing the studies as well, by all indications, their vaccines should cover this as well. And so that's good news. The virus hasn't changed to the point where the vaccine isn't working. It still seems to be working very well against the virus, even with the changes. But one thing to realize, again, because people do get nervous about hearing about these changes and these variants, this is normal for a virus. This is natural progression of a virus. And keeping an eye on it is important for the experts and the public health uh, entities to do that to make sure it doesn't mutate into something where we need to change the vaccine. But if you think about the history of the pandemic, there is no longer any of the original Wuhan virus floating around. That virus has mutated to the point where it is now these other variants, including the UK and the South African variant. And so that, again, is just a natural progression of the virus. And so that's where we are with the variants and the vaccines. But the other one I want to talk about is what information just came out. The Journal of Medi American Medical Association, JAMA, just came out with a, a study. And in their article, what they said is they found out that looking at the variety of, of the way the virus spreads is that 60% of cases of coronavirus came from asymptomatic spread. In other words, the vast majority of coronavirus was spread by people who either didn't have symptoms or I'm sorry, never had symptoms or didn't have symptoms at that time, but were eventually going to get symptoms. In other words, they were pre-symptomatic. And so they looked healthy to everybody, including themselves. And I tell people, and I've been telling people over the last couple of days, if you're around somebody, especially right now, and they're coughing and they look miserable, you're not going to get close to them because you're going to think coronavirus. I don't want to get close to them. But a lot of us don't have second thoughts about getting close to somebody that looks healthy. Well, it turns out that healthy looking person 
is responsible for the vast majority of the spread of coronavirus. So we need to avoid healthy looking people as much as we need to avoid sick looking people because we know that spread can happen that way as well. And this is just kind of a, another warning that we all need to do that social distancing and wearing masks, regardless of who we're around. If there's somebody that's not actively living under our roof, who we're not actively around on a regular basis for the last couple of weeks, because that spread could be there, even though they look great, even though they feel great, even though you and them think they have no issues at all. Remember, up to 40, maybe 50 percent of people with coronavirus don't have any symptoms. They're completely asymptomatic. They look wonderful. But at the same time, they're responsible for the majority of the spread of coronavirus. And so, again, this is one of those things to keep in mind. So looking again at what I'm talking about here, the numbers, they're much, much higher than they've ever been in the past. 268,000 cases, over 4,000 deaths in a single day. We expect those numbers to go even higher before they start coming down. But we can all do our part to make sure when they start coming down, they continue to go down. And as we get the vaccine and starts rolling out to more people, we start having more, we, we use those human behaviors to keep it under control. The variant, the UK, South African variant are out there. They're in mo multiple countries, including the US, at least the UK one is, it's been confirmed. But the vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca look like they're gonna work against this variant, which is great news. And then the, the asymptomatic spread of the virus, the vast majority of spread of the virus comes from people who look perfectly healthy, but they have the virus inside them. Now, let me see if you have any questions. How long after being around an asymptomatic person can you get infected? So how long after being around an asymptomatic person can you be infected? And I'll answer this in two different ways. One is how long do you have to be in contact with that person to be infected? And the answer is uh, there is no one solid answer for this. The CDC typically says if somebody has COVID-19 and you're in close proximity to them for 15 minutes, meaning within six feet of them for 15 minutes, then your chances go much higher of catching COVID-19. But that means cumulative time throughout the day. And so if you're in line at a store for a couple minutes and there's somebody around you that has it, and then you're in line somewhere else for a couple minutes at a different store, and then you're around friends that are asymptomatic, but they might have it for 10 minutes, those numbers add up during the day to that 15 minutes. But that's not an absolute number. 15 minutes doesn't mean that absolutely, if you're 14 minutes, you're gonna be fine. It just means that once you hit that 15 minute point, your chances go even higher. But below that 15 minute point, even a few minutes, even a few seconds can expose you to that virus, and that's why you, you can't let your guard down. So that's how long it takes to catch the virus. As far as once you get the virus, how long does it take for it to start showing symptoms? Usually the incubation period, three to 10 days, three to 14 days we typically talk about, and that's why we have that 14-day quarantine period because you could start showing signs and symptoms in that time period, or you could simply have the virus and never show signs and symptoms, but could certainly spread it to other people take to have antibodies once you have the vaccine? So how long does it take to have antibodies once you have the vaccine? And this is a topic that came up a few months ago when we were looking at antibodies and how much protection you actually got from the antibodies. And so there are two different basic types of antibodies that happen. Once you start getting the, vac the virus in your body, your vaccine, the first thing you do is you get this thing called the IgM. Those are the immediate antibodies, and it's kind of a global immune response. Basically, your immune system sends out these IgM antibodies to try and take care of any infection they find. And then that happens usually within a few days of getting the virus and lasts up for a few weeks. And then around a four week period, you start developing what are called IgG antibodies. Those IgG antibodies are very target specific for the virus itself. And those are the good antibodies. Now in med school, I always thought of it IgG, G being good. And so those are the good antibodies that can help target it and they stick around for a long time. When you get the vaccine, Usually what happens is two weeks after you get the second dose, you start developing those IgG antibodies and you start getting them. On top of that, you also get these T cells, we call them. T cells are basically, think of them as helper cells or there are some called killer cells. These are basically your immune system in the background and they're, they're the alert system. And so they'll look for the virus. If they find it, they alert the immune system and it can start developing those IgG antibodies. That typically takes two weeks, but two weeks after the second dose, Here's why. The first dose is a primer dose. The first dose, your body gets it, and it's basically, both for both Pfizer and Moderna, they basically induce your body to produce that mRNA pro spike protein. And so it's not the whole virus, it's just a little protein, which is what the, the immune system wants to attack. And so it basically primes you the first dose it shows your body that it shows your immune system that spike protein and so your immune system says okay now we're on alert for the spike protein but we're not very strong we're just on alert 
Four weeks later or three weeks later, depending on which vaccine you get, you get the booster shot. And that booster shot really pushes up your immune system to start producing those antibodies to attack the virus. So now your immune system not only recognizes, but is, but is very strong at fighting it specifically. And that usually happens two weeks after that second vaccine because it takes two weeks for your immune system to fully activate. And so think of it, if you get either Pfizer or Moderna, think of it as about a month and a half prospect to get full protection, to get that 95% protection. Can you still get the virus after having both the vaccine? So can you still get the virus after having both the vaccine? Yes, and a couple reasons. Number one, the virus, the vaccines themselves, if you think about it, the Pfizer vaccine, 95% efficacy. In other words, it cut down your risk of getting COVID-19 by 95%. The Moderna one, 94.1. So essentially we say 95% for both of them uh, just to make things a bit easier. But that 95% is not 100%. And so that means that it could still break through. And the way it can break through is if you're in a if you're in an area with heavy amounts of virus, in other words, there are a lot of people spewing out a lot of virus, then it can really attack the body. It can overwhelm the immune system and it can still get into your body. And that's why it's not 100%, especially in the midst of an overwhelming pandemic. And that's why we say, even if you get both vaccines and you've waited your time period, you're more protected from the virus, but you're not completely protected from the virus. So you two need to wear masks. You two need to social distance. You two need to avoid the crowds like everybody else until we get the pandemic under control. Once more people start getting a vaccine, we'll have less numbers of cases. And so we'll get this pandemic under control. On top of that, they're still looking to see. Now they know from studies, because this is the way the studies were carried out, that these vaccines, this Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, can protect you from getting COVID-19. In other words, they can protect you from getting the disease. What they don't know is if they can protect you from getting and spreading the virus that causes the disease. And that's what they're looking at right now. They think it will, but the studies only looked at the disease because they wanted to make sure they got the disease under control first. And logically looking at viruses and vaccines in general, they typically stop you from catching or transmitting the virus at the same time. And so more than likely these will as well. It's just science hasn't quite borne that out yet. Have these vaccines been tested on Native Americans? Have these vaccines been tested on Native Americans? Yes, they've been tested across ethnicities. They've been tested across ages. They've been tested across people with medical conditions. And so in this case, the FDA was very specific saying, we want you to test a variety of races and ethnicities. Latino, Native American, African American, Asian. They really went all out to try and test them Numbers weren't as high as they were in, uh, or as high as some people would have liked, but at the same time, they had higher numbers than they typically have in most clinical trials, showing that they did work against a variety of ethnicities. Now, age being a factor, they kept expanding it, getting older and older people involved. They dropped it down to age 16, and so 16 and above can now get the Pfizer vaccine, and Moderna is 18 and above, and they're looking at 12-year-olds and above, both vaccines are testing that now. Once they get through that, they'll start testing five to 12 year olds. And once they get through that, they'll start looking at even younger children. And so the thinking is that this vaccine is gonna become one of the vaccines that children get in their infancy once they get through those clinical trials and once we have more knowledge of what's happening in that young age to get them protected, much like we do with measles, mumps, rubella, uh, any of these other variety of diseases that are out there that we control with vaccines, this is gonna be one of those as well. But thank you so much for your questions. These have all been fantastic questions. And going over the headlines again, number one, the variant, there's the UK and the South African variant. The UK variant is already here in the US and we know it's in 30 plus countries. This variant means that the virus has changed a little bit, but the good news is Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca are all saying it looks like their vaccine will still be effective against this variant. And this is what viruses do generally. And so it's not a big surprise it's changed like this. They're keeping an eye on it to make sure it doesn't change more substantially because if that happens, then we'll have to be more concerned about it. Asymptomatic spread, right now, the vast majority of cases come from people who don't have any symptoms. And so you have to be careful regardless of who you're around. And then the numbers, unfortunately, these are daunting numbers. 2,000 or 268,000 cases yesterday, 4,110 deaths in a single day. And so we know this is coming from the holiday travel. It's going to continue to get worse, but we can all do our part to make sure that we keep these numbers and subsequent future numbers under control and get this pandemic 
the numbers and cases as low as we can while we all get the vaccine to make sure we push those even lower. Thank you very much. This has been wonderful. And I hope everybody has a healthy and a happy weekend. Thanks. Are you a fan of our videos? Be sure to subscribe to Worldwide Campus News and Entertainment. Then ring the bell to see all notifications about the new videos and the latest video.